I'm excited, I'll tell you that much. I think I'm particularly excited because as a church, we've been reading through the book of Acts and it's been so powerful, right? And the more I read the book of Acts, I would say, maybe excited is not the word, I would say I'm expectant. Because you, the more you read through the book of Acts, uh, what most theologians agree on and most Bible commenters will say is that Acts has 28 chapters, but it's not a definitive finish. What they're saying there is, it's not a book that finishes and a recount of what was, an account of miracles, an account of people speaking in tongues, an account of thousands of people meeting Jesus. That, that is an account of what was, but Acts 29 is an account of what is. And I get expected, not just excited to preach, but expectant because as our church gathers around the book of Acts, it, it brings us to this fact that, you know what? We're living in those days right now. Dare I say, tonight could be the night where the person you invited meets Jesus for the first time. Tonight could be the night where something that you've been praying for, for maybe months, weeks or years, it just comes to pass. You know why? Because we're bringing our expectation here. And the thing about expectation, it's got nothing to do with the preacher, no matter how great or how lousy they speak, but everything to do with how hungry our heart is with meeting with our Creator. So uh, I'm, I'm expecting to that end. Yeah, before you, before you take a seat, if you're gonna give a clap, give a real clap and give it up for Jesus. Yeah, okay, you can be seated. As you do, would you turn with me to the book of Acts? That was not two minutes. It was the book of Acts chapter two, verses 42 to 47. I love this passage of Scripture. Acts chapter two, 42 to 47. As you turn there, I just gotta say, I'm so humbled and honoured to be preaching on the platform where I've been watching the majority of my life and inspired by preaching and teaching that really has changed me. So to be up here is kind of surreal and uh, God is going to do what God is going to do. Um, so it says this, uh, the fellowship of the believers, they devoted, the second word, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and the signs performed by the apostles. It says all the believers were together and had everything in common. What a picture of unity, right? Not that they were the same, but they wanted the same thing. It goes on in verses five. They sold their property and possessions in a Sydney market. Wow, no, I'm just kidding. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Uh, each uh, picture of sacrifice right there. Every day they continued to meet and gather at the temple courts. They broke bread uh, in their homes and ate with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of people. And verses 47 said, and the Lord added to their number daily those who've been saved. Uh, it actually says that a plethora of time throughout the book of Acts. It says 3,000 people were added to the church that day. 5,000 men came to, came to meet Jesus that day. And, and you read this theme throughout Scripture and what you've seen is the early revival breakout. Jesus ascends to heaven, says, I'm sending you a helper, helper being the Holy Spirit. And then what I wanna focus on tonight is not so much the acts of what happened, although they are amazing, but how the early believers got there. So if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, you could title this one of two things. The first title is Spiritually Healthy Christianity. It sounds wholesome, right? Spiritually Healthy Christianity. You know why? Because, I mean, revivals are great, but revivals are the prize. The goal is being more like Jesus. The goal is being closer to Him every day. Or I like this title a little bit better because it's revival season, it's the book of Acts, A Recipe for Revival. Let's pray. Jesus, Lord, I thank You right now that we have the opportunity to gather, gather around Your Word in Your house. Lord, I pray for every person here, Lord, that their hearts are receptive and reactive to what You wanna do. Lord, I pray that as, as I'm speaking, Lord, that You speak to each and every person here that we leave completely different. Lord, that we exit this room different from the way we entered in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Also, if I could add to that prayer, I would say to Jesus, if we could be vindicated, the New South Wales Blues, from the robbery that happened on Wednesday night, that is just, that's just not okay. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Is anyone familiar with the term of a bucket list? Okay, for those of you who aren't, it's when you write things you wanna do in your life down, uh, how do I put this, before you go to be with Jesus. That's for the rest of your days. The things you wanna do before you don't do anymore, okay? That's what a bucket list is. I've never written one down. It's not really how I do things, but I've got things in my head growing up that I always wanted to do. As a kid, I always wanted to go to the United States of America. 
You know, back then I was like, America. It's like now I'm like, America. It's like, it's different. <laughs> But I wanted, to watch an NBA, I, I wanted to watch an NBA game. My wife is American, I love that country, just a disclaimer. My, I, I wanted to watch an NBA conference finals game. So I was there 2013 watching my team, the Oklahoma City Thunder. <laughs> Nobody cares, okay. <laughs> yeah, we had the dream team, KD. I mean, we had Harden, we had Westbrook, and we had everything but a title. That's, it, it's, yeah. Again, nobody cares. Um, I go to the game and it was everything I dreamt of. You get in there and like the room is loud. Americans are proud people, you know. You walk in and they just sing the anthem for no good reason but just to sing the anthem. Like if it was church, I would tag the anthem on, I reckon. Anyway, and then you get to the game and then like the halftime show. It's not like our halftime show here where it's, you know, it's like, uh, like the kids giving it a go. It's like the under sixes version of the sport and you're like just wasting time. It's like an actual show. But as you're there, they're showing the trophy of the team and what they're going to get. And I know I'm speaking to a, a very academic, a very well-educated crowd right now, uh, a community, if you will. But let me, let me ask you a question. Where do you think the athletes, the professionals, were shooting that ball? Were they shooting it at the prize being the trophy, or were they shooting it at the hoop for the points? Clearly, the second, the latter, they're shooting it at the hoop. And as I read this scripture, it popped out to me. Maybe we've made the prize the goal and not the goal the goal. Let me read what the, um, the David Guzik, he's a Bible commentator, actually my favourite from the Blue Letter Bible said about the passage, Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. He says, rightfully so. The people were mesmerised, even caught up in the rushing sounds of winds, the tongues of fire, salvations by the thousands, dot, dot, dot. Can you imagine that? All remarkable events. But God's true ingredients to church growth is what followed after. The believers focused on God and God brought the revival. God brought the growth. And I just want to say, I mean, like Phil said it perfectly a second ago, we love the tree, isn't it? But no one's really interested in the seed. I mean, we, we love the success story, but no one's interested in what it took to get there. Because we're talking about a recipe for revival and I'm also addicted to sugar. I mean, I love the lemon meringue, but I'm not really interested in the ingredients. Like, I'm not, I'm not like, flour, man, I love flour. It's like, it just doesn't happen. But kind of what I want to focus on is, yeah, I'm really funny. Um, <laughs> kind of what I want to focus on as a church is what got us there. Like, I mean, like I said at the start, and I really want to harp in on this, before we see a corporate revival, we, we got to have an individual revelation. And, and, and I think if you, if you peel back what's happening in the Bible right now, and you peel back every revival outbreak of the days, whether it's Azusa Street, or whether it's with a John Wesley, or, or whether it's with Billy Graham, or all the greats, all the people we preach about and look up to, what I believe is if you peel it all back, there is just your average man, your average woman. And what do they all have in common? A heart devoted to Jesus. I reckon if you peel it all back, what you see is you see the mum waking up early and you see the mum with tears coming out of her eyes as she prays for her son or her daughter or her husband or her friend who doesn't yet know Jesus. What you see is the dad, the businessman, the worker, as he goes to work, a heart devoted to God so he doesn't cheat in his ways. No, but he puts God first in the way he conducts his business. And as you see this, I, I, we won't have time to go through every little aspect, but it says the First thing, after all, this thing, all these amazing miracle works happened, this is what the Bible says. It says they devoted themselves. What did they devote themselves to? The apostles' teaching. That's the teachings about, that's first-hand account of what Jesus did and to fellowship. And I reckon church, I mean, trust me, I love the idea of packing stadiums. I love the idea of seeing thousands come to, and like works of the Holy Spirit, like it excites me so much. But can I just propose a thought to you? That's the price. The goal is being more like Jesus. The goal is being more spiritually healthy. Because out of a devoted life, out of time spent in the Bible, you start to walk different, you start to talk different, your perspective begins to change, you begin to have patience and joy and kindness because you've spent time with Jesus. And this whole, I mean, this whole season in our church as Phil has been talking about and talking about and talking about is a church that is healthy will eventually grow. But we've got to get back to what really counts and that's spiritual healthy, uh, spiritually being healthy. And as this church, I want to encourage us a church that I've had the honour to grow up in. 
I mean, I, I, I know that the day is coming when you'll peel back what continues to happen here and what you'll see is just average, ordinary people like me and you whose hearts are devoted to God. So with that thought, I'm gonna, that's ingredient number one. But for ingredient number two, when it's only gonna get better and better, you're gonna have to listen to Shekinah Hill. Hi, church. You guys are very, very kind. Thank you. It's so good to be with you here tonight. And it's equally a little terrifying, but that's okay, safe place. Okay, you guys can take your seat. Um, thank you so much, Drew, that was awesome. Um, you know what I actually should have done? Um, well, first off, hi guys, I'm Shekinah. It's so nice to meet you if I have not had the privilege of meeting you before. I am um, one of our creative pastors here on staff at the Hills Campus, and it's the very best thing. I'm also a very proud American, so actually, if you could stand back up, we're gonna sing the national anthem, if that's okay. Just kidding, sit, sit down, because the best. <laughs> hey, I love that we are speaking about a recipe for revival, um, that we're actually taking some time to talk about spiritual health and how we can get it, and how can we see this revival that we just pretty much spent an entire worship set singing about, which is incredible. But the thing is, in order to see the revival that we dream of and that we crave to experience in our lives, we actually need to take the time to foster a healthy spirit that is ready and able to nurture his presence. So. We are in part two of this recipe of revival. And with Drew, we've established the why. Why we need a spiritually healthy life. And my, I mean, fingers crossed, you want one, that you would like a spiritually healthy life, but <clears throat> what does living a spiritually healthy life actually look like, okay? So because, so part two, this is where we're gonna go. Um, okay. Thoughts. Here we go. Guys, this is great. This is great. Okay, so we're going to take some time to establish what it actually looks like. Is that okay? Because sometimes we think that spirituality is all of these different facets. And, but the thing is, it's actually not just one dimensional. So it's not just this one and done thing. This is spirituality, I can write it down, here it is. It actually has multiple components that cultivate a, your spiritual and our spiritual outlook in life. So, I've got two more ingredients for you to add to this recipe, if that's okay, so that we can see this revival that we've been praying for, is that all right? Okay, but first, I'm gonna need a little bit of congregation participation, is that all right? And don't, don't panic, it's just like a raise of the hand, you'll be okay. So. Where are my extroverts in the room? If you are an extrovert, hand up. I knew it was gonna come with cheers, because us extroverts, we can't stay quiet the minute that they're like, extrovert, you're like, yeah! It's the best. I am, fun fact, I am also an extrovert. I am a lover of people, and um, like probably a lot of you here, if this wasn't your portion, I'm so thankful for you. But um, at the beginning of the year, to kick off my year, I had COVID. And, um, it, and it was fantastic, because I don't know, I'm just gonna take you back, hopefully I'm not gonna trigger anyone, but remember we had to do the seven day isolation. And I, when I found out I had COVID, my housemate said, bye, um, I will not do that, thank you very much. And so I had to isolate all by myself for the seven days, me, an extrovert. And it was over the New Year holiday, so I rung in the New Year all by myself. It was the actual worst. All of that to say, I need people, and that is what I have learned. Okay, my introverts, where are you? I'm sure, here. <laughs> I also anticipated that's what it would be. Extroverts, yeah, introverts, yeah, right, whatever, whatever you want. <laughs> and anybody that's like an in-between, an ambivert, they're kind of, kind of like, you can't pick a side, so you're like, I'm both, you know, I wanna be myself, I wanna be with people, I can't decide. But here's the thing, so this next ingredient that we really, really need to understand when going on this journey of developing a spiritually healthy life is this. Ingredient number two, are you ready? We need a spiritual community. 
Um, in Acts 2, 42, I love that um, Drew actually talked about it. This is what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. You see, spiritual health, it is not done on your own. The ultimate spiritually healthy life is a life that is planted in a spiritual community. Now, if you are taking notes, which I hope, but if you're not, no, it's okay. There's no judgment here. Safe place. Um, I want you to underline, highlight, bold the word, word spiritual in that statement. Because it's not that. I did not say that the ultimate spiritually healthy life is a life that is planted in a community. I said a spiritually healthy community. And so a spiritual community is, simply put, a community of like-minded spiritual individuals. That's all it is. So the fact that you came to church tonight, your church community, that is a spiritual community. And how you can actually enhance that community is out there in the foyers tonight. We've got wood fire pizzas. We've got live music. You're welcome, Junior, shout out. Um, there are things that are happening where you can actually get involved from a community perspective. Connect groups. Are you a part of a connect group? Because that is a great way to enhance your spiritual community. And if you're not, there's a next step, next step desk out in the foyer. Go see Nancy. She's very kind. And she will help get you into connect groups. RDGs, where are you at? Let's go. Okay. That is a spiritually healthy community. And this is what it says in 1 Peter 2, 5 in the Amplified Version. It says, you believers, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house for a holy and dedicated priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. Here's the thing, fam. We cannot do this thing called faith or grow to be the women or the men that God has called us to be in isolation. In order to experience this revival that we crave, we actually have to rid ourselves of this isolation mentality that unfortunately COVID has enhanced in our lives. And we need to remember that we were created to be together and we were created to grow together so that we actually can offer up a holy sacrifice that is pleasing to our very, very good God. Alrighty, ingredient number three is this. We need personal transformation. We are currently in a series that is all about the church and the power of the Spirit. And last week was really awesome because we actually took some time and we talked about one of the gifts of the Spirit. But here's the thing. We cannot rely on the gifts alone. Now, before you stone me, say heresy, all that sort of stuff, get off the platform, hear me out, okay? In Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23, it says this, but the Holy Spirit produces the kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Here's the thing. We cannot neglect the power and the necessity of the fruits of the Spirit because it is by our fruit that we will be known. So we all know the saying. Listen, you can even finish it. because What is the saying? Actions speak? Precisely. So my question to you is this. What do your actions say about you? Do people use any of these words to describe you? Can people tell that you are different on a Monday after church on a Sunday? Or do you have the Monday blues like everybody else? I'm going to ask a controversial question because I'm hoping to never do this again. Okay, my question to you is this. Do people even like to be around you? Sorry if that hurts. I apologize. Like I said, you can just tell them. Let, listen, don't let her do this again. Now, here's the thing. Really, really quickly. I do not want us to get this confused, that question confused with the question, am I loved or am I valuable? because we should never doubt what God declares to be the truth over our lives in his word. So that's not what I'm asking. And just a side note, if that is something that you might be doubting right now of going, I don't know if I'm loved, I don't know if I'm valuable, please, if you get anything, you are so loved and you are so valuable. And that is a truth that God declares over your life 
in his word. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm asking is, do people like you? Do people want to be around you? Do people feel better when they walk away from being with you? Do people feel like you show them love wherever they find themselves? Can you rejoice with them? Do you have patience towards them? Do you have kindness for them in their faults? Can you see the goodness in their lives? Are you a faithful friend? Are you a faithful spouse? Are you gentle in nature? Are you controlled in your behavior? Do people see these things? In Acts 4, um, Peter and John are preaching to the people, and the religious leaders of the day, they come, and they're really offended by all the things that they're saying, and so they throw them into jail. And then when they kind of go, okay, this is your time to speak up from yourself, Peter, who at this point in time, he is full of the Spirit, and he tells everyone the truth of who Jesus is. And then we come to this verse in verse, um, chapter 4, verse 13, and says this, The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. You see, church, when your life is changed by the revelation of who Jesus is and what he has done, and you are transformed by the power of the Spirit, then you should experience a personal transformation that allows you to become exactly who God intended you to be. A person who is truly human, a person who can operate in the gifts and the fruits of the Spirit, and a person that when you walk by, someone may see an ordinary person, but then they go, I think that person's been with Jesus. You see, God will not give us what we are not spiritually close to being capable to contain a move of his presence. It demands diligence. It demands determination and discipline in our personal and spiritual health before we can even see, let alone steward, a move of God that we have been praying for. So there are a couple more ingredients left in this recipe, but I'm actually going to leave that to my very good friend, Tyler Douglas. Can we welcome him to the platform? Thank you so much, Shekinah. Who thought she kind of just crushed that? You are a good one. You are a good one. Well, you can take your seat. You can take your seat, you rowdy bunch. Oh, it is good to be at church, isn't it, on a Sunday night? And I feel really honoured to be sharing around this thought of a recipe for revival. Love you guys. You are my family and this is my home. And as much as I might be a little bit nervous right now, this feels safe. This feels like something that I'm called to do, even though I really didn't ask to do this. Or even like she kind of said, we're happy to never do this again. But... I'm really passionate about what we're preaching about tonight. And I want to shout out to all my friends watching online and family. We love you so much. Come join us in the room. It's a thousand times better, I promise. But look, we've talked so far about this, and I'm just going to get straight into it, if that's okay. No time to waste. Is Drew, uh, he talked to us about why? That we need a personal revelation of Jesus before we go for the prize of revival. Because we've seen that through COVID, what happens when we're not spiritually healthy. And then Shekinah, she just talked about what it looks like, personal transformation. And so I want to talk about how we get there. Basically this, how do we become more like Jesus? How do we uh, grow towards spiritual health? And there are so many things I could talk about, but I love what Shekinah just read in Acts 4 verse 13. And this is the person that I wanna be, a person that someone can tell has been with Jesus. It says this, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. So I'm just gonna repeat it. I know she just said it. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. That's me, so I can take comfort on this. I'm slowly starting to get better at reading my Bible and getting deep into the commentaries and whatnot. But they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. And church, if I can encourage you with one thing, that is how we're gonna see spiritual revival take place within ourselves. If we can be people that are more like Jesus each and every day, that our friends and our coworkers, that they can look at us and go, there's something different about you. Just as Moses talked with God when he walked down from the mountain in the Old Testament, people could tell that he had been with God, that his face was shining. And what I love so much is that this is where it starts, that we know why, that we know what it looks like, that it's all about a personal revelation. It's all about personal transformation, becoming more like Jesus. But I wanna talk about how. And I love that as in this season, our church has been focusing on health. Pastor Phil and Lucinda, it's been such an aim for us and I'm personally loving it and I'm feeling healthy and I'm feeling refreshed. But I wanted to talk about just one ingredient, maybe a couple, but maybe just one tonight that we can focus on. I was thinking about talking about prayer. I was thinking about talking about Bible studies and fasting and communion. But the one thing that I wanted to talk about, this ingredient of how, 
How do we see personal revival within ourselves? How do we become more like Jesus in order to go to the prize of collective revival? And it's simply this, it's through our worship, this ingredient of worship. For you see this, when we worship, we become more like Jesus. When we take time and when we glorify God, when we step into His presence, not only do we access His presence, but we become more like the source of spiritual health. And if you don't believe me, I'm gonna break it down for you in a second. I love that uh, Dr. Hayden Nelson this morning preached an amazing word. He is a doctor, he has his PhD. He's just very humble about it. He doesn't like to tell people. But in case you don't know what worship is, I just wanted to break it down for you. It's simply this, and this is what Hayden said this morning, that worship is all of us glorifying all of Him, all that God is, taking the focus off ourselves and completely glorifying God and all that He is. And I love that when we do that, we shift the focus and we start to become more like Jesus. We start to have that personal revelation tick away in us, brew away in us, stir in us. And it's that simple. It's through our worship. And I have grown up in this church all my life and we have been blessed. I think you could agree with me that we've been blessed by songwriters and great music, great worship, um, great services, great conferences. But can I tell you, that worship is not about that. It's so often would I turn up to a service or an event when I was younger and I used to go, oh, that person's not worship leading or, oh, they didn't do that song in the set list or it's not summer camp last night, so God can't possibly speak to me right now. But that's not what worship is. That's going, oh, worship is about me. Let's get a little bit more vulnerable and honest. In COVID season, I would sometimes rock up to church online in my bedroom or bed and be eating cereal. And I'd be like, or in my pajamas, is it just me or did anybody else kind of? No, you're, yeah, okay, I see that hand, thank you. Um, and you would rock up and I'd be like, oh, who's worship leading this morning? What's the song? And I would so often just completely miss the point that I wasn't spiritually healthy and I wasn't looking at what is worship about. But worship isn't about us. It's about shifting and turning our focus on towards the one that is worthy of it all. And so here's what I want to break it down for you. Romans 12, verse one to two in the NIV. And then I wanna read it in the message because I believe it just it sums it up so much better than what I ever could. Online, I hope, you're, you're, I hope you're into this and I hope you're understanding this. You see, we need to take our eyes off ourselves and focus them on Jesus. And that's exactly what our worship does. And Romans 12, it says this, therefore I urge you brothers, Paul writing to the church in Rome, brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Verse two, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. If we wanna know God better, if we wanna know His will, if we wanna see a glimpse of the revival that He has, that we need to draw close to Him, that we need to worship, that we need to offer up our lives. And as we do that, we will draw closer and closer and we will become more like Jesus. And as that stirs in us, we will see collective revival is this making sense to you tonight, church? Well, then if it's not, then I've got Romans 12, one to two in the message because I love how simple and pure Eugene Peterson writes this. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work and you're walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for Him. So don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking, get this church, get this church online. Instead, fix your attention on God. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. You will be changed. We will be changed as a church community from the inside out as we place the focus off ourselves. And the things of this world will go strangely dim, it says. We sing it and we sing it so often in the light of His glorious face. When we, when we worship Him, we drop everything and we focus on Him. And I love that promise that He will renew us and He will change us. You see this, when we worship, we give everything we have to God, like Romans 12. And it teaches us that we are shaped and formed like Jesus and less of the world. You see, when we are people not found in worship, we can listen to the wrong things. We can look at the wrong things. We can only ever draw ourselves further away from what the promises of God are. And more importantly, who God has called us to be. But I love what Romans 12 says that when you fix your eyes on God, He will shape you. It says this, fix your attention on God and you'll be changed from the inside out. I thought just in case you're still not getting the point, I will read out from my main man, N.T. Wright, something that he wrote from one of his books, Simply Christian. And it says this, you might become, sorry, not you might, you become like what you worship. There it is. When you gaze in awe, admiration and wonder at something or someone, you begin to take on something of the character of the object of your worship. It's a bit hard hitting, isn't it? 
I didn't really like it when I read it because I went, wow, over the last two and a half years, what else have I been worshipping? And that's my question to you. What are you worshipping, church? In this season, are you actually really desperate for personal revival? Personal uh, revelation of becoming more like Jesus? Do you understand what Drew and Shekinah have been talking about? That in order to see this room filled, that's awesome, but it needs to start here. Because we've seen over the last two and a half years what happens when it's not in here. We've seen that result of when we don't focus on our own spiritual health, then are we really ready to sing, Lord, send revival? Do it again over this land. Are we actually prepared to see that if we're singing it, if it's not right in here? So what are you worshipping? Are you worshipping that relationship? Are you worshipping that job, that income, that money? Is that defining you? Maybe you're worshipping the past. Maybe you're caught up in maybe something God did ages ago and you just can't let go of it, but maybe you need to. Or maybe you're too focused on worshipping the future. Maybe an idea or a dream that is, maybe it's, if all honesty, you know it's long gone, but you're caught up in worshipping it. What are you worshipping? And if you are, and you're like, uh-oh, maybe I've been worshipping the wrong things. Maybe I've been drawn away from Jesus. Maybe this personal revelation of stirring up personal revival. Maybe I'm far from that. Well, I've got good news for you. God loves you so much, and He's there to be worshipped. And it's this simple. Psalm 100 says, On your feet now, applaud God. Not on our feet right now, but soon. On your feet right now, applaud God. Bring a gift of laughter. Sing yourselves into His presence. Know this, God is God and God, God. Simple. He made us. We didn't make Him. We're His people, His well-tended sheep. Enter with the password, thank you. This is how easy it is to worship. Enter with the password, thank you. Make yourselves at home talking praise. Thank Him, worship Him. For God is sheer beauty, all generous in love, loyal always and ever. That's as simple as it needs to be, church. As simple as it. If you go, how do I become more like Jesus? It's just worshipping, thanking Him, praising Him, telling Him that you love Him, just coming before Him as simple and honestly as you can. It's that simple. And I love the most powerful songs are the ones that completely take our focus off ourselves. Uh, personal testimony for me, I feel like God has been refining me and we just got back from a holiday and I feel more passionate and on fire for the call of God. I want that spiritual relation, uh, sorry, that spiritual revelation, but it happened a couple months ago when I was here. Matt Crocker was on platform and he was leading, how great is our God? Sing with me, how great is our God? And all will see how great, how great is our God? He's the name above all names, worthy of all praise. On oh, my heart will sing, how great is our God? And I don't know about you, church, but when I sing that, I can't help but focus on the goodness of God. And that's the glory that what we're aiming for and what we're running towards is that, is how great is our God that He loves us so much, that He wants to shape us, that He wants to do collective revival, that He wants to do a work in us. And all it takes is this. It's not some crazy mathematical equation. It's just worship. Yes, it's prayer. Yes, it's Bible reading. Yes, it's being a part of a community. But the one thing I wanted to make super simple tonight is that your worship can push you towards a spiritual revelation of becoming more like Jesus. I have, I have a big passion and full of faith that we would see our youth ministry packed to the rafters, that this service on a Sunday night would be packed to the rafters, but not for the sake of numbers, but for the sake of people wanting to be spiritually just full, full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, that our high school students, where's my wildlife people at tonight? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? That we would have a young generation that's passionate about seeing their school saved. I don't care about numbers on a Friday night at wildlife, and I know that's not where we're at at a church either. But I know if that we have young people on fire for God, and that's going to make a switch, make something different, change in our high schools, and that's where it begins. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm most passionate about. And so I'm going to close with this, and the team can come up. I guess we know that we have to worship God, but we have to know that what we're worshiping is what we'll become. But do you know who you're worshiping? Do you truly have that deep revelation of who you're worshiping? A good friend, a good mentor. A good pastor once said that the God you know is the God you'll show. And you're like, what does that even mean? The God you know is the God you'll show. Is that kind of what happened with Peter and John that the Jewish council saw them and they saw Jesus. And that's who Peter and John were inclined to, to almost radiate off themselves, just like Moses is the God that they knew was a God of love, a God that they could trust, a God that they could walk in the Holy Spirit. Do you know that there is a God that loves you? Do you know that there is a God out there that is so kind? so compassionate towards you that wants to worship with you, that doesn't want just your praise and glory, but He wants to do a relationship with you. Do you know this God that we're talking about? Um, I've got good news, bad news and great news. As we kind of bring this to a close and we, and we land this plane about this God is that He loves you so much. That is 
really, really good news that He created you and I for community. Online, He created you and I to do relationship with Him. The bad news is that we've all fallen short from this God, that we've made mistakes, we've said things, we've thought things, we've pulled out actions that have drawn us away. That's the bad news, but the great news is this, that God loved us so much that He persisted with wanting to be in a relationship with us, that He sent His one and only Son, God in flesh, love personified, the love of God, Jesus, so that we could be reconnected with Him, so we could understand the beauty and awe of our God, so that when we worship Him, we go, God, thank You so much. You are worthy to be praised because of Your Son. But friend, do you know that God? Do you have a relationship with that God? And if I could ask you to just bow your head and close your eyes, I wanna pray for people in this room that don't know that God. You know what, maybe two groups of people, you once did know God, you once had that relationship, but maybe you've slipped away. Maybe you haven't been to church for ages or maybe you just trusted in listening to that worship song. Maybe you trusted in listening to that podcast, but you're here tonight and you go, actually, I think you're talking to me. I think I've actually lost my relationship with God. I actually don't know about the one that you're talking about. I don't know about the one that can stir spiritual revival in me. Well, I wanna pray for you and the other group of people that I wanna pray for is those that have never accepted Jesus into their heart. That you actually don't know that God at all, that you may have walked in here for the first time or you might be watching and tuning in online and you just stumbled upon this or someone sent you this link. I wanna pray for people in this room tonight that wanna accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour and come back into right living relationship in the Father. And so I'm just gonna count to three. And I just want you after three to raise your hand and I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna make you jump through hula hoops. I'm not gonna bring you down the front. I'm just gonna count to three. If you wanna accept Jesus into your heart, then I want you to lift your hand just so I know who I am praying for. One, God loves you. Two, He wants a relationship with you despite all your mistakes. And three, why don't you lift your hand if that's you. Across this room, if you want relationship with Jesus, I see that's awesome. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Not gonna rush this moment at all. This is why we do church. This is why Drew and Shekinah spoke tonight because this is the source of health. This relationship with Jesus is it. This is where revival starts. Thank you, Jesus. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you're saying, yes, Tyler, can you pray for me? Well, we're gonna pray together as a church family from the front to the back, from side to side. And if you just wanna repeat after me, this is purely just a prayer accepting Jesus into your heart. So why don't you repeat after me? Dear Jesus, come on, church family. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. I surrender all. I, surrender I want to stop living my way. And I want to start living yours. God, I thank you for your son. I thank you for his death. And I thank you for his resurrection. Come into my life and help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we give these people a round of applause? Right now, across the link as well in church, would you mind standing up right now with me across this place? As we conclude the service, and I'm gonna hand it over to Sam. We've gone in a little bit of overtime, but I'm just following my global senior pastor, Phil. He just does it all the time. But um, hey, just to bring it back for one second, this is the greatest decision you could ever make, church. Online, if you made that, then here are three simple steps. We wanna give you a gift of a Bible. Everything that we preach from, everything that this church stands on, its foundation is the Word of God. Get this into you and you will continue to see a, a personal revelation, a personal revival, and you will continue to become more like Jesus. The second thing I'd love you to do is to tell someone that you made this decision. Whether you're online, put it in the comments or as you grab a Bible, make sure you tell the person. And the third one is this, is come back. Come be a part of this church. Come be a part of a church. We wanna do community with you. We wanna do life with you because it's better together. Amen. Amen. Well, we love you so much, church. Thank you so much for listening and, and I hope and pray that that blesses you and that we would grow towards personal rival. Pastor Sam.